conclusion of the study on Genesis chapter 3, I mentioned that I would be doing an additional episode related to the chapter. I title this, What Happened in the Fall? It's a biblical psychology, if you will. It's something that I've shared over the years with both large groups and individuals that's helped many better understand themselves, their struggles, and how to press forward into greater maturity. Now, I'm going to be using graphics that I admit are not great. I'm not a graphic artist, as is obvious to anyone who <laughs> watches the Into His Image YouTube channel. I'm not a videographer either. Uh, so please forgive the rudimentary graphics. I still think they're helpful in visualizing the ideas that we're going to be exploring. So let's take a look first at humans before the fall. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we read this, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, in our study in Genesis 2, we saw this verse relates the creation of man with three distinct elements. A body, seen there in the words, God formed man of the dust of the ground. A spirit is seen in that God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And a soul, found in the words, man became a living being. And we saw the word being is in other places rendered as soul or person. It's connected with other words like desire and passion. Man is a united whole comprised of body, soul, and spirit. We find this spelled out in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, where we read, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The body is this physical vehicle that's comprised of the same elements that make up the earth. It's our dirt suit, if you will, the thing that we share in common with the physical universe. The soul is the sum of our mind, emotions, and will. And by mind, don't think brain. The brain is a physical organ. It's part of the body. The mind is more than the brain. It's that immaterial part of us that assigns values and priorities to all the facts that our brains catalog. The spirit is also immaterial, and it's the part of us that makes us truly unique and different from the animals. The spirit is that divine spark implanted in us by God that brought life to the body. It's in the level of the spirit that we apprehend morality and truth. Now, as we read chapter 2 of Genesis... It appears in man's original creation, these three parts were in harmony, each fulfilling its intended role. Because man was created in the image and the likeness of God, as verses 26 and 27 of chapter 1 say, and since God is spirit, as John 4, 24 says, it's reasonable to assume that prior to the fall, man was mainly spiritually minded. His primary context for living was in and from the perspective of the spirit of what was right and in agreement with what is true. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, we read that God came into the garden in the cool of the day. From Adam and Eve's reaction, we knew that he was coming to fellowship with them. This was probably at least a daily occurrence, that God would come to commune with man and woman. Such fellowship required that Adam and Eve would be operating primarily from the place of the Spirit, now, in such a spiritual state, their soul, that is their minds, emotions, and will, would be yielded to and influenced by the goodness and the truth that their spirit fed on. The mind would have been pure and clean, realizing the power of truth and constantly making connections and drawing conclusions about the righteousness and love of God. The will, informed as it would have been by the mind, would have been in a state of constant surrender to the Lord. And the emotions designed by God to be responders and affirmers of the right choices of the will, would have provided constant delight. The body was simply the vehicle that the spirit and the soul traveled in on God's good earth. And before the fall, we see how it was allowed to fulfill its task in simplicity when we read that Adam and his wife were naked but not ashamed. In other words, there was little attention paid to the body beyond what was necessary. It was respected as a part of God's creation and managed to his glory. Now, if we could represent man in a diagram, here's man before the fall. 
The spirit is the primary mode of man's existence with the soul and the body yielded to the life of the spirit. The soul is arranged like this. But look what happens to man when he disobeys God and sins. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, we read, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Now, what do we see happening here? Weren't their eyes open before? So what does this mean? What is it that they now see? Well, they see their bodies. And what they see is a need for their bodies. So they take immediate action to meet that need. Now take note what they don't do. They don't go running to God for help. And that is a major clue about a huge change that has taken place that we see, well, even more clearly in verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, this is a sure sign that Adam and Eve have suffered a mortal spiritual blow. They thought that they could hide from God. When God first gave the prohibition of eating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he said the penalty was death. Now, we know they didn't die physically the moment they ate, but they did die spiritually. Their spirit lost touch with the author of life, as evidenced by the fact that their whole grasp of both morality and truth were thrown into doubt and confusion. They grew fearful of God and thought that they could hide from him. Totally inappropriate responses to God. But they signify how spiritually out of touch they now are with him. Observe the reversal that has taken place in man. The body has now risen to the place of prominence while the spirit has been shattered and lost fellowship with God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says that before we come to faith in Christ, we are dead in trespasses and sins. That deadness is in the realm of our spirit. We are spiritually separated, cut off from fellowship with God, which is the essence of spiritual death. So here's what happened to man in the fall. The body has risen to the place of dominance while the spirit has lost fellowship with God and so abides in a state of death. But this reversal has affected the soul as well. It has gone through a reversal of sorts. The soul, which used to be yielded to and influenced by the spirit, is now given over to serving the demands and dictates of the body. The emotions, originally designed to be responders to and endorsers of right choices, well, it rises to the high ground and starts placing demands on the will and the mind. Pleasurable emotions become a priority while painful emotions are shunned. The will is driven to make choices that will put man into these pleasurable and emotional and physical states. And the mind, once filled with holiness and truth, is now pressed into the mode of figuring out how to maximize physical pleasure and hang on to happiness. Here's how the Apostle Paul describes life apart from God in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. He says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. You see, their minds are now empty and vain because they lack the enlightening power of the Spirit. Verse 18, Having their understanding darkened, though their heads may be full of facts, truth is lost to them. He goes on, Being alienated from the life of God. You see, they're alienated, they're separated, they're cut off from spiritual life because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Verse 19, who, being past feeling, because corpses don't feel anything, and that's what they are, spiritual corpses, he goes on, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Without spiritual life, there is no life left but the life of of the body. So people post fall define themselves by their body, pursuing existence in the realm of the flesh, trying to find satisfaction, which forever eludes them because that is not what they were created for. When we are born again, God does a work of spiritual resurrection within us. In the 20th chapter of John's gospel, after the resurrection, Jesus breathed on the disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. It was at this point they were born again. 
just as God breathed into Adam's nostrils to start his spiritual life in the original creation, so the new creation of salvation begins with God breathing on us and imparting to us his spirit. His spirit quickens ours. We can picture it as a kind of, well, spiritual mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. Now, in the moment that we are born again, we go from being spiritually dead to being alive. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14 says, We know that we have passed from death to life. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. But this regeneration doesn't instantly restore us to the condition of man before the fall. No, it puts us in a new configuration. And in this arrangement, we choose in which mode we're going to live, the flesh or the spirit. And this is why we see the constant appeals in the letters of the New Testament to live and walk in the spirit. These appeals are so numerous and so much reason is brought to bear precisely because we do have a choice and because there's a battle between the flesh and the spirit. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, Jesus said to the disciples, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. In Galatians 5.16 and 17, Paul says this, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. The battle between the flesh and the spirit rages because prior to our being born again, well, we lived out of and for the flesh. We identified ourselves that way and developed habits that are now deeply ingrained in us. Besides that, we live in a world of others living in and for the flesh. The whole world system is engineered by the devil to constantly hammer us with temptation to live where? In the flesh. The crucial issue then is the soul, for that's the realm that choice is made. Notice that in both the pre- and post-fall conditions of man, the one unchanged part is the will. It's the pivotal point, the deciding factor of where and how man will live. Eve chose to sin. She made a choice to exchange the truth of God for a lie. And Adam chose to follow her. What's important to realize is that the will makes its choice based on the information that the mind sends it. So the mind is the crucial issue. It's in the mind that the will is swayed. Listen to Paul as he writes of this in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And so we see the options laid out before us to live according to the flesh or the Spirit. Verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Jump on down to verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. In the second verse of Romans chapter 12, Paul makes it even clearer when he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The transformation that Paul means here is the outworking of our conversion from being spiritually dead, body-based people, to being men and women who walk in the spirit. That transformation will take place through the renewing of our minds. And that renewing will take place when we turn away from the wisdom and counsel of the world to the wisdom and the counsel of God as found in his word. The life of the spirit is a life of faith and faith comes by hearing God's word. That's why we read in Romans chapter 10 verse 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, with this as a framework, 
As you read the New Testament for the pathway to spiritual maturity and victory that's laid out there, you will see how all of this works together. As we conclude, consider the role of emotions. Our emotions are meant to be a responder to and in, an endorser of right choices, which are in turn informed by a truth-filled mind, which is yielded to a spirit in fellowship with God. Emotions aren't meant to drive choice, nor should we live with the aim to gain a certain feeling. The person who lives for happiness will never attain it because happiness isn't the goal that God designed us for. Satisfaction, fulfillment, isn't something we get by focusing on them. No, happiness, satisfaction, and fulfillment are the byproduct of intimate communion with God, a reward for seeking what we're created for. Whenever you find yourself making choices aimed mainly at feeling better, realize that you're aiming in the wrong direction. You know, aspirin doesn't solve the root problem of pain. It just blocks the pain signals to the brain. It's a temporary mask that doesn't really fix the problem. Well, don't make the mistake of taking spiritual aspirin. That is, of making choices calculated to maximize happiness while minimizing sadness. No, rather, walk in the Spirit. Invest in the things of the Spirit by regular time in God's Word, prayer, worship, fellowship with other believers who are also walking in the Spirit. Mm -hmm.